Okay, so we've spent some time discussing the mechanical behavior of metals. Okay, you're familiar with the general shape of the curve for a metal, like this. No surprise. Okay, that is for a metal. What's the curve look like then for a ceramic, say, for example? <clears throat> and so for a ceramic, the curve might actually look something like this. It's kind of linear elastic right up until the point where it fractures. And on the other hand, if you looked at something like a polymer, which we'll look at in more detail later, you know, you may have something like this where there's an extremely large amount of strain, but relatively low strength and low elastic um, modulus. Okay. Um, so what I want to do though in this video is look into a little bit more detail at this orange one for the ceramic. Okay, that's a ceramic. <clears throat> and just for completeness here, I better label that. That was a polymer. Okay, so for, for a ceramic, sure, they, they're typically um, quite high modulus, high Young's modulus. They can be high strength in, in compression. That is, if you, you, know, you take up, this is a piece of chalk, it's one of my beloved pieces of chalk. If I, you know, if I squish it like this, that would be compression, and they're quite strong that way. In tension, they tend to be weak. Um, little cracks in there tend to create stress concentrations and, and uh, that leads to the, the low properties and tension. But a bigger question that I want to address is how am I, am I going to test this in, 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 um, you know, in, in tension? You know, if, if this, uh, you know, we said for the tensile test, I, I, I squeeze it really carefully and I, and I pull it or stretch it, but how am I going to do that to a ceramic? If I want to do that, you know, I'm going to grab it really hard like this on one side and I'm going to, I'm going to pull it. Well, if I, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I made a mess. What happened? It crumbled in the grips. That's actually something that really happens. If I try to do a mechanical test on a ceramic, it's very difficult to grip it like that. It, it tends to crumble. And so how instead do we do a mechanical test on a ceramic? Well, the answer is, we often um, don't test them in uh, don't test them in tension, you know. And what are some reasons? Well, it tends to be difficult to grip. It crumbles in the grip. Okay. Uh, another reason is um, <clears throat> they're actually pretty difficult to machine. They're to form, I could say, or a more technical term would be machine, because often you <clears throat> would take the sample and you know you turn it on a lathe and cut it to to the shape. You know the classic shape for a tensile specimen was something like this, right? Well, that shape, you know, even whether it's cylindrical cross section or rectangular cross section, is quite difficult to machine from a hard, brittle um, material. The bit tends to wear away really quickly when you're cutting it because it's so hard. Um, the ceramic itself tends to crack and fracture, so you lose lots of parts. Um, so instead, we'd like a simple part geometry that we could maybe cut on a water-cooled wheel or something like that. Something simple, some simple geometry. Um, and another thing, which we won't really elaborate on too much, but Machine alignment is very difficult to achieve. Uh, let me elaborate briefly on that. Okay, so it's difficult to get really a valid tensile test. So in this specimen over here, for this to be a valid uniaxial tensile uh, test, we'd have to get this loading axis here aligned exactly with the, the, this long axis of the sample so that all the load is in tension. In reality, what happens is you put the sample into the machine and it's a little bit off axis. Um, I could exaggerate here. You know, I'm exaggerating greatly. But if I put a ductile material like a metal into the machine and I loaded it off axis like this, and I, you know, I gripped it, I applied it, well, what would happen is it would deform plastically and it would eventually become elongated with the loading direction. Um, 
and you know, provide, I mean, I greatly exaggerate this, but if it were just slightly off axis, it's okay. Some plastic deformation would allow the sample to, you know, as you go through here and it plastically deforms, very quickly it becomes aligned with the loading axis. Ceramics are so brittle and they fail at such a low value of strain that it's difficult to get it aligned just right in the machine. So instead, we need something uh, we need something different, and so what we tend to uh, we tend to use is instead we load the samples in bending. Okay, load it in bending. <clears throat> and what does bending look like? On well, bending, you need a beam, and so the specimen might look something like this. Uh, I'm going to take a rectangular cross section, although you can load other cross sections in in uh, in bending, and then what you do is you support it in a couple of places on the bottom. Like this you have a couple of supports, and then you load it. Now this particular one is supported in one, two places on the bottom, and a load is applied to the top. So it's called three-point bending. Okay, this one is three-point bending. Now, in research, four-point bending is actually a little bit more trusted. It's uh, got a uh, it's more repeatable, more representative, but three-point bending is quite easy to do, and for that reason, it's a good one to discuss at this point. <clears throat> so a few things that we'll need to define here are this, this span here, call that the length, um, sample dimensions, we've got the sample height, and then we've got this sample We'll call it the width there. Okay, um, and you know this simple part geometry is really pretty easy to um, to machine. You just slap it onto these lower supports and apply the load, and <clears throat> Bob's your uncle. You get your your test. Well, it's not quite that easy. Can you just take force over say this cross sectional area or something? No, no, you certainly cannot. Um, if you know a little bit of beam theory. You may know, in fact, that you know there's this neutral axis through the you know if this is a cross section like this right in the middle, where the lower surface of the beam is in tension, and the upper surface of the beam is in compression. Or if you think about just um, you know bending or take a stack of papers like this and you bend it. You, know, you can see how they get skewed like that. The lower surface is getting longer, and this top surface is trying to be being made shorter. It's in compression, being compressed, the bottom's being stretched out. <clears throat> and so in the middle it goes to zero, but th that means that there's completely opposite signs from the top to the bottom in the magnitude of the stress. And I just say that to drive home the fact that there's going to be stresses that differ through the thickness. So what we need to know is we need to know, well, where is this going to break? Um, and ceramics tend to be poor in tension, as I mentioned, so they are going to break on the lower surface of the beam. And it turns out that the peak stress on a three-point bend test is right in the middle underneath where the load is applied. Um, so my sketch is not ideal. This force should be applied right in the middle between these two uh, supports. But that's where the peak stress is, right here. That peak stress is right in the middle on the lower surface of the beam. That's the peak tensile stress. So it's there that we calculate the uh, stress, and at fracture we call that the fracture strength, or the bending strength. So the equation for what the stress is on that lower surface of the beam in the middle, we could call the three-point bend um, strength, and it is this, 3FL over 2 width times height squared. Okay, so that is the calculation. You could derive that in a, perhaps a different course, a mechanics uh, course, beam theory course, but that is the equation for the peak stress on the lower surface of a beam loaded in three-point bending, and that's how we would create this curve, uh, typically for a ceramic, the one we have uh, all the way up here. Okay, so you would actually do it in bending, 
and plot it there like that. <clears throat> All right, thank you.